Yes, I've entitled tonight's message, Marriage Under Fire. I wonder if we are aware that between January and March of this year, more than 1,200 applications for divorce have been filed in Jamaican courts. Last year, a total of 3,689 were filed for divorce, three persons filed for divorce, uh, a marginal decrease from the previous year. According to an article in the Sunday Gleaner of April 25th, Jamaicans are walking away from their marriages in droves amid the throes of a coronavirus pandemic. And that's only one of the challenges facing marriages, both in Jamaica and in the United States. In the United States, for instance, more than 50% of all marriages end in divorce. The most commonly reported major contributors to divorce were a lack of commitment, infidelity, and conflict. Within the last 10 years, homes headed by married couples increased by 7%. But hear this, within the same period, homes headed by unmarried couples increased by 72%. People no longer view marriage as the culmination of romance. Cohabitation, what we call in Jamaica shacking up, is now the preferred option. Webster's Dictionary describes cohabitation as living together as lovers when not married. It's now cool. As a matter of fact, a gentleman by the name of Richard Posner wrote a book entitled Sex and Reason. And here's what he says. Of course, we cannot agree with this, but here's the statement. He says there is no good reason to deter premarital sex, a generally harmless source of pleasure, and for some people, an important stage of marital search. Posna is wrong. Premarital sex is not a harmless source of pleasure, and we got to call a spade a spade. Even with consenting adults and within the context of cohabiting, sex before marriage is always wrong. I think some of you might be saying, but, but Brother Dave, remember you're speaking to Christians. That's exactly why I'm saying what I'm saying. Because some, some of us believe that since we intend to get married, and since we are adults, we can begin to taste the joys of marriage because we are going there anyway. That is such a lie from the pit of hell, it ain't funny. As a matter of fact, this is how Paul describes it in Ephesians 5, what he says. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. And so the, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. And I, I've heard some Christians trying to trivialize and say, well, sin is sin. So if one steals a mango, it's just like having sex. Stop it, my brothers and sisters. The terms that are used in the Bible to describe sexual sins are very, very explicit and very clear. There is a reason behind this. Look how it's described by the writer to the book of the Hebrews, where he compares marriage with non-marital relationships. In chapter 13 and verse 4, he says, marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, we can add, by all. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. It could not be clearer. And all here does not mean all Christians. 
it means all human beings. Marriage should be honored by everyone. And the marriage bed must be kept pure. It is not giving us license to use another room so we can engage in illicit sexual activity, but not the marriage bed. That's not what the text is saying. It's a figure of speech that's talking about a, a behavior uh, in this regard. What are we getting from this verse, Hebrews 13, 4? It's teaching, in other words, that fornication, which the Bible describes as sex before marriage, and adultery, which is sex outside of the limits of marriage, uh, that's behavior that, that might find accommodating. But Hebrews 13 is suggesting that this kind of behavior is unfaithfulness, therefore it is disloyal. It is emotional abuse in that it's disrespectful. It is irresponsible in that it's sin. It's a breaking of God's law. And Hebrews 13, 4 is very clear in this regard. It did not begin in the New Testament. If you come with me all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. That was God's desire from the beginning. Observe the clear gender distinctions in the text. I am not being guided by the sociology of the day. I am not being guided by the so social media. The Bible is making it clear concerning these distinctions. Observe the clear gender distinctions in the text. Man and wife. Also father and mother. I have reason to believe that we would need to be emphasizing this more and more as we as we as we move along because uh, in, in, in some circles that's certainly not acceptable where uh, pronouns are being changed and uh, uh, it's going to be coming straight to Jamaica and my brothers and my sisters in Christ we need to know for sure where we are getting our guidelines from our guidelines come from God's word and Genesis chapter 2 makes it clear for this reason a man it's not just a person. A man will leave his father. That's another man who influenced him and would leave his mother and would be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. I have reason to believe on our return to the United States, I could get into trouble to preach a message like this. But my brothers and my sisters, when you hear that David Corbin went to prison, it is not because of some crime he committed, but because he chose to obey God's word to the letter. And if this is what we, at the price we may be called upon to pay, uh, even here in Jamaica, don't say it will not happen. Because as someone says, when you sneeze in the United States, you catch a cold in Jamaica uh, because we just, we are copycats and it's only a matter of time. Remember Genesis 2.24, it was always there and it's still there. A man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Even a casual observation of nature reveals the vital distinctions between male and female and the need that each has for each other. And uh, even with the, the athletic uh, games that we have going on right now, uh, it is very, very obvious that men are stronger than women and men are faster than women. We are made differently. It does not make one superior to the other, but we are different. And the Bible recognizes this. The Bible, men and women are uniquely designed to complement each other physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
heterosexual marriage or marriage between a man and a woman is the means for merging the two genders into a stronger and more complete whole. God did not make a mistake by bringing male and female together. There's a specific purpose for which uh, this, this is done. And uh, we are going to note that some more. The five major world religions today, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism, recognize and uphold the natural and heterosexual understanding of marriage. But obviously, because Christianity is the largest of these religions, and because Christianity uh, resorts to what we may view as a conservative view, we will always be under attack. But my brothers and my sisters, Jesus predicted that this is the price we would have to pay. It is not fair for brothers and sisters in other parts of the world to experience severe difficulty and hardship and we get away scot-free. Their faith is being tested in ways that we would not want our faith to be tested. We feel God has abandoned us. And, and uh, when they are asking for prayer, they are not asking to be released from their pressures. They are asking us in the West to pray that they would have the strength to, with, with, to, to uh, withstand the pressures. And our pressures are coming on the grounds of marriage. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I submit to you that if we are going to find the cause, the root cause of the criminal elements in Jamaica, we are going right back to the subject of family. We are going right back to the rule, the gender rules, the rule of the father, the rule of the mother in the home. It's very, very clear. Marriage is the first institution ordained by God. It has served from the beginning as the foundation for continuation of the human race. Jesus underscored the importance and the sacredness of marriage in his own teachings. Paul taught that the marital relationship is to be an ongoing demonstration of the sacrificial love that Christ showed for his church. And so Satan would want to mar marriage in that when marriage is destroyed, the picture of the relationship between Christ and his church would be destroyed. The Bible teaches that marriage between a man and a woman is unquestionably good for them and for society. And you can look at the stats and let me share a few with you. These are from non-Christian sources cohabiting or living together prior to marriage does not necessarily lead to successful marriages. Satan would want us to believe that it's a good opportunity to try out, to see if it would work. Then who determines if it's working or if it's not working, if both are trying out? What standards would they be using to determine if it's working or if it's not working? And it's a trick from the pit of hell. The University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1995, in a study released, says cohabiting couples have an 80% an chance that their relationship will end. 39% of never married cohabiting couples <laughs> lasted less than a year. Thomas and Colila, it's a nine, 1992 study, produced the results saying that couples who had cohabited before marriage have lower levels of happiness and higher divorce rates. Cunningham and Antil in 1994 produced these results. Couples who lived together before marriage also separated more often, sought counseling more often, and regarded marriage as a less important part of their life than those who did not live together before marriage. Cohabiting demonstrates a lowered view of and commitment to 
to marriage. Let me repeat that. Cohabiting or shacking up demonstrates a lower view of and a commitment to marriage. Here's the question that would confront us. How does marriage differ from cohabiting? Here are some ways in which marriage differs from cohabiting. How does marriage differ from cohabiting? Firstly, marriage is a legal contract between two people and the government. Cohabiting is like you go to a friend's house and you watch TV, you go home. You go back the next night, you watch TV, but because you're tired and it's so late, you just say, cha, and I'm going home. And after a few weeks, you realize, well, why do we have to pay rent for two places? Since we are here, we can. And so there's no official contract between these two persons, and marriage is different. It's a legal contract between two people. State laws control who we marry. So we know we can't marry our sister. We know we can't marry our, our, uh, our auntie. Uh, the state law states clearly, laws control the conditions under which we marry. Uh, in that if someone is, is mentally incapacitated in some way or form, uh, the law would not allow us to go through it, such a marriage. Uh, laws determine the minimum age for marriage. Uh, you just can't say, well, look, I, she's so cute. What, and she's so nice. Uh, laws prohibit that. Cohabiting does not. Cohabiting, for whatever reason, would feel the younger the better. Uh, Marriage controls that. Jamaica requires that an application for marriage be made with a clerk of courts and a wedding be conducted within a specific time from the date of the application. It's a contractual arrangement. Laws control the financial relationship within marriage because you are, you are literally making major commitments in this process. Divorce laws control the termination of a marriage. So there are laws that govern marriage. Marriage is a legal contract. But marriage is also a moral contract between two persons. In their marriage vows, a couple makes certain promises to each other. Couples are morally bound to abide by these vows. These vows are often confirmed with the exchange of rings. These vows are shared before many witnesses. There's a moral contract. And you don't just pick up people from the street to witness it. You invite the significant others in your lives. And marriage is a moral contract. It's not just signing a piece of paper, as some would want us to believe. Thirdly, marriage is a spiritual contract between two people and God. Christians believe the idea of marriage began with God. It's not a Jamaican thing. It's not a brethren thing. It is a God thing. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 puts it this way. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Marriage is a God thing. It is within this marriage union. Marriage provides a responsible context within which children are born and cared for. And so this is why a man cannot just walk away from his children if he is married. There is a, a sense in which he can be held responsible by the law. Um, secondly, marriage facilitates a context for mature love based on commitment and self-giving. In other words, marriage provides boundaries for lovers. And that's why within the boundaries of marriage, it can be said of one that you are unfaithful to your marriage. You committed adultery. You went outside of these legal boundaries that were established. Marriage is a union. So it provides a responsible context within which children are born. Uh, it facilitates a context for mature love. Thirdly, marriage provides context that leads to companionship that is secure and stable and meets some of our deepest needs. 
it's marriage we are talking about here. And uh, just go through the book of, of Ecclesiastes and again, and you would see uh, how, it's, how it's mentioned over and over, where two are better than one and how we can support each other. Go through the book of Song of Solomon and see how marriage is, is glorified in, in that context. Fourthly, marriage provides a responsible setting for sexual union between a man and a woman. It does not, it, it, it limits you. And, and some may say, well, well, I don't want those kinds of limits. Well, if you don't want those kinds of limits, it's because you do not respect your partner because you want to, 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 to you want a fling. You, you want to have multiple women or the woman wants multiple men. But marriage says, no, no, no. There's a responsible setting for sexual activity, and it's in the context of marriage. People within the concubinal uh, relationship uh, or cohabiting, as we may call it, uh, there's a, a kind of moral responsibility, yes. But there's almost like a condition that is set. Uh, we're not married, you know. We're not married. And, and so there's a, a, a kind of feeling that this is a casual sort of situation. Marriage does not allow that. It's a union. Go back to this book of Hebrews and see what it says in chapter 13 and verse 4. The Bible refers to marriage as honorable. The writer uses the word, uh, uses a word that means precious to describe marriage. It is the same word used to describe the blood of Jesus. It's precious. In classical Greek, the word is used to describe the cost or the value of something. In summary, the Bible sees marriage as valuable, as priceless, as precious, as honorable, as pure, as worthy of respect, the Bible sees marriage as that which must be cherished, to be esteemed. That's how it's described in the Bible. As a matter of fact, one of the thoughts that I have been sharing within recent months with folks concerning marriage, if you look at all the institutions and the investments that we make in our lives, I would like to suggest that the most important investment you have, sir or ma'am, is your marriage. It is out of your marriage that children are born. And the children, as someone reminded me, within 18 or 20 years, they are gone. But where are you still with your marriage? It is in your marriage that you are equipped for your job, particularly so if it's in the church. But even out in the secular world, I was sharing recently how surprised I was when we lived in the United States and a police officer came to our home. And I wondered, what did we do wrong now? Uh, and he said, you guys have done absolutely nothing wrong. But your neighbor has applied for a job. It's a federal government to work in insurance. And because of the nature of the job, we have been commissioned as the local police officers to check him out. And all we want to know from you is the kind of home that he keeps here. Is it the place where a lot of cars come by and there's a lot of drinking? Is he a wife beater? Um, what, what about his marriage? What do you know of his family? And you figured that this man was applying for a pastoral position. It had nothing to do with the pastor, had nothing to do with church. But they recognize that within the institution of marriage, responsible people behave responsibly. And he was applying for a job, and they wanted to know, is this a responsible man? Because they too recognize that marriage is honorable and pure and worthy of respect. Now, within it, the same verse that we have here before us, Hebrews 13 and 4, it, it's teaching us that within the boundaries of marriage, sex is undefined. I'm not here to try and define sex within the boundaries of marriage. And in our counseling, we have had people asking, is this allowed? Is that allowed? I am not going to give you a list because the Bible says within the context of marriage, 
sex is undefiled, and you create your own list. Uh, as long as you're observing sanitary conditions, as long as you're showing consideration for each other, there is thoughtfulness, and whatever you're engaged in, it's a mutual joy, a mutual sharing. The Bible says that's allowed. It's free from steam. It is, it's undefiled. It's pure. It's, it's the same word used to describe Jesus in Hebrews chap, chapter 7 and verse 26. He is pure. Could you imagine this is how God is describing marriage, your marriage and my marriage? He sees it as pure. He's saying it's the best thing that you can imagine. It's your best investment. So if, 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 you, if you know, for instance, that you have a significant amount of money in a bank and you heard that uh, some, some hanky-panky business was going on at that bank, one of the first things you would want to do is to protect your assets. Now try to imagine your marriage is of greater value than what you have in your bank. It's of greater value than what the business that you own. Any investment you can think about is secondary to your marriage. If that is the case, then why don't we go the extra mile to protect our asset when it talks, when we talk about marriage? And so here's what I would like to suggest as we pull pieces together. Hence, all forms of deviant sexual behavior is destructive. If marriage is this holy, if marriage is this pure, we're seeing any sexual behavior outside of this context can be viewed as destructive. What do we mean by outside of this, this context? Firstly, we looked at cohabitation. It destroys the model of Christ and his church in that it lacks commitment, it lacks loyalty, it lacks honor, and it lacks selfless love. That's cohabitation. What about adultery? That too is a deviant sexual behavior. It destroys the immediate and the extended families of the parties involved in the marriage. It gives you the impression, enjoy the now, and you forget the pain that comes years later. And sometimes, you know, some enjoy the now, and then they discover, ouch, pregnancy has come about. So how can I cover my trail? And then you get into abortion. And so you move from one sin into the next. And you keep walking around as though nothing is wrong. But what you're doing, you're a murderer. And what you are doing, you're an adulterer. So you're living a lie. And the enemy said that your life would be happy. But the truth of it is your life is miserable because you broke the hedge and you, you went outside of the boundaries of marriage. So cohabitation as, as a, is a deviant the sexual uh, as, uh, in terms of marriage. So is adultery. And what a promiscuity. It destroys loyalty and facilitates abuse and narcissism, which is self-absorption. We're, we're just satisfied with, with, with our, own, our own self. Uh, and that's promiscuity. You're still married, uh, but, but you, you, you are the nice guy around and you, you're very well known. And my brothers, my sisters in Christ, I wish I could say, not so in the church, doesn't happen in the church. Oh, my brothers, my sisters in Christ, I can't give the examples. All I would tell you is that I'm a counselor, and so is my wife. And the people we counsel are mainly people who are in the church. It is amazing to hear how we rationalize our behavior. Some of us who believe since we are saved and we are always saved, God will always forgive us. So we can do what we want on Saturday night and wipe our mouths and clean up ourselves and then go to church on Sunday morning because God is a forgiving God. How presumptuous of us to think of our God in that way. So cohabitation, we, it destroys the model of Christ and the church. Adultery destroys the immediate and extended families of the parties involved. Promiscuity destroys loyalty and facilitates abuse and narcissism. And then there's homosexuality. 
which destroys the biblical model of marriage. The homosexual model is unable to reproduce itself. Did you ever notice that? It cannot reproduce itself. So the homosexual model is a parasit parasitic model in that it depends on heterosexual relationships for its own survival. That, that cannot be right. It cannot be right. But that's what is described in this relationship. The homosexual model is deceptive in that it provides companionship, but not compatibility. Compatibility requires two genders to be able to enjoy that kind of relationship. The homosexual model is unhealthy in that our bodies are not designed to facil facilitate same-sex intimacy. The homosexual model is selfish in that it exists only for its own gratification. The homosexual model is sinful in that the Bible lists it among deviant sexual behaviors. This is how it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians and he's saying this kind of behavior is not becoming of people who claim to be Christians. And if you continue in this kind of behavior, and it's not just sexual deviance, there are a list of other things mentioned here. When you continue in this kind of behavior, you're demonstrating the behavior of a non-converted person, and chances are you are that kind of person. But I have good news for us tonight. Healing is possible. However, healing and forgiveness and cleansing are possible for anyone engaged in deviant sexual behaviors. And so tonight, it's not a, just a laundry of dirty behavior. The Bible is saying healing is possible. This is how Paul describes it in the following verse, in chapter 6 and verse 11. And that is what some of you were. What he described in 9 and 10, he said that was your, what you used to do, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Hear what he's saying? You were washed. You were made clean. You were sanctified. You were separated unto God. You were justified. You were brought into a right relationship with God. Uh, just this week, I read of a country in Europe where to preach a message like this, you can now be arrested because uh, it's, it's, it's illegal to suggest that this kind of behavior can change. My brothers and sisters in Christ, my understanding of the scripture is very, very clear. When Jesus comes into the light, drunkards can be changed without going to Alcoholic Anonymous. All kinds of kinds of things, people, because the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become new. And God is still in the renewal business. And so tonight, if you are listening to my voice, whether you are here or you are listening to the recording on a subsequent occasion, we are not here just to identify sin. We are here to say, thank God there is a solution. There is an answer. That's what some of you were. You can be cleansed. You can be made whole. No 12. All three verbs are in what is called the aorist tense, indicating a once-for-all event which had completely transformed them. You were washed. You were cleansed. 
you were justified. All three verbs are preceded by the word but, which is for emphasis. You were like this, but this is what happened. You were like this, but, and it brings intensity and emphasis to the point. Change is possible because of Jesus. That's why I preach, because I know that change is possible in the most ugly, the most difficult circumstance. If you doubt me, go back to the cross. The cross was intended to put a stigma on Jesus in that the Romans did not even crucify their own people. They crucified the worst of the worst. They crucified foreigners. And isn't it interesting that the very cross that should be viewed with such disdain is the very cross that we use as a symbol around our necks. It is the very cross before which we bow from time to time and we wear that cross with pleasure. What has happened is that the power of God by raising Jesus from the dead and by Jesus himself even on the cross, the power of God was so evident that it was on the cross that Jesus said, this is finished, it is finished. The cross was victory, it was not defeat, it was not failure. And what was intended to bring this grace and disdain to Jesus brought victory. That's why the thief on the cross could shout, remember me when you, uh, when, when you come into your, go into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus assured him, yes, without baptism, Without church membership, Jesus assured him, today you'd be with me in paradise. And one of the gospel writers explained it this way. After Jesus shouted, it is finished, we find the words, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain. What does that mean? From top to bottom, the veil which kept the holy of holies separate from the other part of the temple. Now, by the cross of Jesus, we now have access. That veil has been removed. So tonight we don't have to look for a priest to be able to take our petitions because we are all kingdom of priests in God's sight. Male or female, we can go to Jesus because when we go to him, he does not say, sister, um, uh, uh, no, he hears us not because of our gender, but because of our hearts. And he will respond when we call on him. Jesus can and does make the difference. He transforms the ugliest to the most beautiful. He heals and restores individuals and families. And that's the Jesus that I believe in. And that's the Jesus that can heal your marriage, sir. If there is pain, you need help. Find help. God will raise up people who can help you. You, can, you don't have to live in the dumps. Jesus died to deliver you from the dump living. Jesus wants you to experience abundant life in the now. That's quality living. And that life can be yours and should be yours. I, I find so often that there are Christians who, who can talk about their faith because on a particular day, something happened, but they do not experience the joy of their faith because they are living such inferior lives. The Lord Jesus has come that we might be able to live abundantly. And my prayer is that as a result of tonight, yes, we admit marriage is under fire, but we can determine if I can't influence Jamaica because it's only me, let me influence my home. Let me influence my church. Let me influence the sphere of influence God has made available to me. I want to close off with these words. Do you realize who we are and why we are where we are? God did not allow us to come into this world during the time 200, 300, 400 years ago, he could have, but he chose not to. He has brought us into this world for such a time as this. He could have allowed us to be born somewhere else in the world, but no, he allowed us to be born in Jamaica. And so I see 
God acting with purpose, that I am not here by mistake. This particular period in history is my time. This is not the time of William Shakespeare. He's gone. This is my time. And God wants to do something through you and through me. And Satan is determined to rob us of living that purposeful life. And it is my prayer that tonight we will find that purpose in our lives individually and in our marriages. Because it's through our marriages, foundations are laid for a better society, a better immediate community. And that immediate community now forms part of the nation. And that nation forms part of the Caribbean. And that region forms part of the Western world. And we can influence the world. One little Jamaican woman, in less than 11 seconds, ran a race a few days ago. And her name is all over the world because she is now targeted because of something that happened right here in Kingston. We can make an impact in athletics. We can also make an impact by the quality of lives that we live. That's our challenge tonight. God can do it. Or whether it be on the track field or right here in church, Galilee can be a different place not only because of who are the elders, but because of who I am and how God can work in me and through me. Praise the glory. God bless you. Oh.